Can you all hear me? Yes. I'm going to move away. It's too bright, the, the projector. <laughs> Um, so we're going to get started. Welcome to Family Medicine Grand Rounds, uh, everyone in person as well as virtually. Uh, today we have a special guest um, to present our Grand Round. So Mr. Jonathan Webb, um, MBA, MPH, uh, is Chief Executive Officer for the Association of Women's Health, Obstetrics and Neonatal Nursing. Uh, Mr. Webb has spent over 15 years in public health space, promoting public health outcomes, addressing social determinants of health, tackling number of epidemics, um, childhood obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. His professional uh, experiences include working for the Office of Epidemiology of the City of Chicago and the Community Health Division of the City of Evanston. Uh, Jonathan also currently serves as subject matter expert uh, for the March on Dimes National Advisory Committee. He is a co-chair of the National Strategy Work Group focused on dismantling racism and addressing unequal treatment under the MAM and Baby Action Network. Um, so I would like to welcome Jonathan um, to give our Grand Rounds presentation today titled um, How History Has Built Racial Inequity in Maternal Health and the path forward. Um, before I hand over the mic uh, to Jonathan, if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask while he's presenting, but you can wait until the end also. We'll have some time. Uh, for those who are participating virtually, feel free to type in your questions or comments in the chat, and I'll be monitoring that, um, and we can go over it at the end. Um, I'll also put in a link for the session evaluation, so please uh, complete that at the end. With that, I'll hand it over to Jonathan. Thank you. Fantastic. Can you hear me? Good afternoon. Thank you all for the invitation. I'm going to step a little forward because that light is abusive. <laughs> Good to see you, Dr. Harris. Um, I'm really excited about the opportunity to share with you a little bit about um, my experience and thoughts uh, around how history has built racial inequity in maternal health. Um, I don't have any uh, financial disclosures or conflicts of interest to report. And I would be remiss if I did not share from an A1 perspective what our mission and vision is to make a difference in the lives of women and newborns. And our members are committed to the health of women and newborns, and we do, we support them. Um, in their care of the patient population they serve through the provision of research, education, and advocacy. Um, first and foremost, um, I wanted to take an opportunity to thank you all, one, for being here, but then two, um, for all of your hard work over the last couple of years. Um, I know that uh, not just a couple of years, but the pandemic has been an unprecedented situation for our country, and the work that our healthcare providers do it often goes unnoticed and it can be a, a thankless job. So I wanted the opportunity while I was here with you to thank you on behalf of the patient population you serve. Um, if you would humor me, uh, because um, I have a church background, <laughs> if you're okay with it, would you mind, is, are, are there social, social distancing requirements in place? I, what, what I ask folks to do is look to the person on your right and give them an air high five and the person on your left and give them an air high five because I, I, I did not did not want to leave this opportunity without getting a chance to thank you. And sometimes as teams, we thank each other and support each other and our work is through our high fives. Um, this is a, a little bit about me. Um, this is my lovely wife of 18 years and my two um, children who would probably be very upset if I showed the, the, this version of this photo because he's now 16 um, and she's now 11. Um, but it's it's, it may sound a bit cliche, but they are my why. Um, they're my reason for doing this work. They're what supports me. And without going too far off track, um, my wife and I have had some challenges um, having a family, and we saw the good and the bad of the healthcare system. Um, we had a really supportive medical team that got us through to this outcome through prayer and that team. But we also saw some of the inequities and experiences, experienced some of the inequities. So having the opportunity to have my position, passion, um, and purpose align in this moment to be able to elevate the voices of families like mine 
I consider to be a blessing. So thank you for the opportunity to share with you. Our objectives for today, we're going to talk a little bit about unconscious bias and define some key terminology, look at where we are today, explore structural racism and its impact on maternal and infant health, identify some opportunities for provider support, and then look at some of the current legislation and policies that will help to bridge that, that gap between public health and clinical services. I like to start with this a little bit of an odd um, visual, but this is a, a, an image of a tribe in Uganda called the Maasai tribe. And one of the things that I found very interesting about this tribe, I learned about them earlier in my career, is that they were known for their um, intelligence and their prowess as warriors. Um, and all of that, um, the acknowledgments and the fanfare they received from those accomplishments, the thing that was most important to them, in my opinion, was encapsulated in their greeting. And their greeting was Kassidian Injari. And what that essentially translated into is, and how are the children? So whether or not you had children yourselves, the greeting that the traditional greeting when you, when you came across your tribal members was, and how are the children? And the response should be, or should have been, was always, all the children are well. So this was a remind, is a reminder for me when I think about this, I hope a reminder for you that no matter what, no matter how strong our society is, no matter where we are from a, from a, a, a comfort standpoint, hopefully we're prioritizing the things that matter. Our children, providing peace, providing safety, stability. And in this work, I talk about this because I don't think you can separate children from moms. So how are, how are the moms and children? And can we as a country say all the moms and children are well? And if you look at some of the data that we have right now, I don't think we can answer that question affirmatively. Um, I understand that there have been presentations that have offered in this setting before, so I won't spend too much time on this. But, and this probably would not come as a surprise to you, but the U.S. has one of the worst maternal mortality rates in developed countries. You can see the trend here of pregnancy-related mortality in the U.S. from 1987 to uh, 2015, how it's been rising, but kind of plateauing a little bit at 17.2 deaths per 100,000 live births. You look at the birth outcomes by race here from preterm, very preterm, low birth weight, and very low birth weight. And you can see the disparities that exist here across the various uh, racial um, uh, uh, groups, uh, with black obviously being in the light blue and Asian being the darker blue line. You can see the, the disparities that exist there. Infant mortality rates by race and ethnicity, non-Hispanic, non-Hispanic um, black on, the, on your left compared to our racial counterparts as you move across uh, the chart there. What was interesting to me is that I've been in this work for a little, in this space for a little while, and while there's been a lot of great effort that's been done, the recent data that came out from the CDC indicates that we really have not moved the needle in a significant way. So in 2020, the maternal mortality rate for non-Hispanic black women was 55.3 deaths per 100,000 live births, which is about three times the rate of non-Hispanic white women. Uh, what was also interesting for me is that rates for non-Hispanic black women were significantly higher than rates for non-Hispanic white and Hispanic women. So we acknowledge that the maternal mortality crisis is a crisis. And the disparity between black women and their counterparts. Just to reiterate that same uh, information graphically, um, you can see that there has been a rise um, in our um, maternal mortality death rates, but you see the disparity uh, and how the, the rates have risen at, at disparate rates from non-Hispanic mm -hmm. white, non-Hispanic black, and then Hispanic. So there is a crisis within a crisis. And again, this is just another depiction of the same data. So for me, um, and I'm sure you as well, when you see information like this, and, and you are probably touching this information as frequently as I am, if not more, there's a, a ping and a call to action around how this needs to be an, 
an urgent response, requires an urgent response, how we need to be intentional in our response, and how when, you, when we start to peel the onion, peel the layers back of the onion, given the size of, and scope of this issue, it's not one that can just be solved by one group, one entity. So there's an, an effort and attention that needs to be placed on partnering strategically to get it done. Uh, one, and one of the, the functions or, or roles that I was proud to hold in my background was an epidemiologist. So I love stats. Um, but when we look at some of the statistics that we shared before, what's helpful for me is to not just let the stats sit there and try to understand the people behind the stats. Um, I don't know if you have had an opportunity to hear of Charles Johnson present, um, but I've heard Charles. Charles is a good friend of mine. I've heard Charles present several times, and every time Charles presents, even though I know his story as well as I, I can without having directly experienced it, as a father and as a husband, I tear up. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Charles' story, Charles and his wife, Kira, Kira, uh, as Charles describes him, was an ex uh, a woman who was in exceptionally good health, um, full of life, uh, race, drove race cars, sky dove, uh, spoke a couple languages, just a fantastic individual um, from Charles' description. They have a son, their oldest son, I believe his name is Langston. Um, they were um, expecting to go into their, um, uh, go into their, what was, should have been, uh, the most exciting day of their life to bring their second son into this world uh, at Cedar Sinai. And uh, through a series of complications that Charles, a series of situations that Charles details, he ended up leaving the hospital with his newborn son, but without his wife. Um, and Charles talks about how um, the pain that he feels um, and the pain that he, the reminder that he gets every time he has to experience milestones without his wife here when he has to explain to his sons why mommy's not here to experience some of those basic milestones that we all, if you have children, experience. And he, one of the things that he talks about is how even with great health care, even with um, um, Kira going into the hospital setting, being a healthy individual, how he felt ignored. There were times throughout her care that he raised the red flag when he saw blood um, and uh, in her catheter and, and was ignored. And one of the quotes that, that, that Charles shares that was a really, a, a real gut punch for him and is a gut punch for me as a person of color is that after a series of several hours, I think it's 12 hours or so of him enduring, him and his wife enduring this situation, after he pinged his medical team one more time and said, I thought we were going to get something done stat, he was told by his nurse at the time that, You're, I'm sorry, sir, your wife is just not a priority right now. And that, those words, when, he, when I hear them, when, he heard, when I hear him share them, they, they, I, I can't help but tear up to think about what that, what that experience is when you are in a position to protect your family as a, as a husband and as a father, and you feel completely helpless in, in a system. Likewise, Shalon Irving, who many of you may know or have familiarity with, Shalon was a member of the Public Health Services Corps, brilliant woman, um, who get, delivered her um, daughter, Sunny Soleil, um, and um, several um, weeks, days after giving birth, she was complaining about some, some, some pain, talked to her, her, her doctor, um, doctor went, went into a doctor's visit, doctor told her to go home, no, no, not a big deal, and she passed away a few hours later, and her, her mother, Wanda, is now raising her granddaughter. Uh, there are several other stories like this, but these are reminders for me that there are real people at the end of the statistics I shared with you earlier. These are lost lives. They represent lost lives, broken families, damaged communities, a cycle of pain that hopefully requires all of us who are in a position to do something to activate with some urgency because this issue can't wait. One of the things that in Charles's story and, and, and from some of the presentations you've heard, there are a number of reasons why this issue could happen. Um, some clinical um, uh, uh, opportunities that could have been done differently. There may have been some um, maybe health issues that could have been prevalent, but I don't think we can deny or dismiss the existence of bias and structural racism that exists in our system. And I'll talk a little bit more about this with you as we go a little bit deeper. 
to set the stage here, um, bias, just uh, for all of us, is prejudice in favor of or against one thing, person, or group compared with another, usually in a way that considers uh, that's considered to be unfair. And there are generally two types of bias, conscious and unconscious, or explicit and implicit. Um, unconscious bias is social stereotypes about certain groups of people that individuals form outside of their own conscious awareness. So you may be interacting with individuals and not aware that you are developing opinions about this group of individuals that you're engage, engaging with or not engaging with. You're just developing opinions without a, an opportunity to connect with folks. It refers to attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding of actions and decisions in an unconscious matter, manner. And it's not simply related to race and ethnicity. So the conversations that we should be having now or are thankfully having now is how our bias impacts not just the, is not, is not just triggered by the color of our skin, but it could be based on age, it could be based on sexual orientation, their age, their uh, gender, there are a number of biases that exist that, that are, um, um, uh, that, we, that may trigger us and impact our way of dealing with others around us. And I think the thing that's most important to note is that um, um, often uh, the unconscious bias often occurs more than conscious bias, which I think is an important thing to denote because um, when, we're, when we're actively doing something, it seems like an easier way to, uh, for me to stop doing that action. When something has become that is that is below the surface and you're not aware of how it's impacting you, I think that's when it can be a little more problematic. So the fact that that um, unconscious bias exists more than conscious bias, I think, is a, should be a concern for all of us. But there's an opportunity for us to address it and move forward. The reason why I think it's okay for us to acknowledge this is that everyone possesses bias. So this is not an indictment of any one group. Bias exists in all of us, and if we're honest about it, because all of us are connected to systems, bias exists in all of our systems as well. There are a few things that we, that we know about unconscious bias. It's been shown to impact hiring practices. It develops in an early age, during middle childhood, and, the, and develops across childhood. It has a real world effect on behavior. And I think the thing that is most exciting to me about it is that there are steps that can be taken to minimize its impact if we take the time to acknowledge that it exists. These are a few examples that I shared. I won't spend too much time here because it's not, not um, totally germane to what we're talking about, but I just did want to highlight the fact and underscore the fact that unconscious bias is a thing and you can see it in a number of different situations. Um, the first example here is um, from a, a study done by Moss Rikusen around scientific faculty and the number of male applicants that were um, for a laboratory manager position was they were deemed as more significantly competent and hireable than their female applicants. Among K-8 and K-23 recipients, the mean salary of female researchers was about $31,000 less than their male counterparts. There was a study that Bertrand and Mullenathan did around um, resumes and they created, a, they created um, a resume that had the exact same criteria. The only things that were different was a white sounding name and a uh, black or African American sounding name. And what you'll see here is that um, white sounding names uh, received a 50% more likelihood of callback than the black sounding names. Um, and then we see here, obviously, the implicit bias because it exists in all of us. It, uh, 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 the bias among healthcare professionals can influence behavior and judgment. And just a footnote about the, the uh, amount of research is out there around uh, this instance. This is a visual depiction of what I shared before about the Mullenathan study. And on the right hand side, a little bit of uh, new information is that um, if you look at the um, racial impact of having a criminal record, You'll see on the um, uh, the right, the left-hand side here. These are white individuals with a criminal record, black individuals without a criminal record, and you can see the disparity in terms of um, interview callbacks based on on this uh, study that was done as well. So, why is this information important? Um, I, I don't want to describe COVID in a positive light, but one of the things that I enjoyed a little bit about COVID was being able to spend time at home and see my kids interact in their virtual platforms with their class and kind of hear what the discussion was. 
and my daughter who at the time was in fourth grade, her teacher in social studies had this visual up and asked the class to provide feedback on what they saw, didn't see, what they thought was going on in the room. And I don't know if my daughter was performing for me in the room because I was making sure that, that she was engaged, um, but she raised her hand and uh, virtually, and she said, one of the things I notice here is that there's no black people, brown people, people of color or women in this room. And this is a picture of our founding fathers when they're starting to frame the fabric of our democracy and our, our nation. And there's not, there are clearly voices that are not represented in this depiction, but also we know in, rea in reality. And what's problematic about that for me is you could, we could argue about whether it was explicit or implicit bias. I think what we know about that time, it was probably more explicit than implicit bias. But given the views that people had at this time around black people and their inferiority, um, women and, and their role, the, you, can, you, can, you can assume and understand what um, the perspectives of these individuals and how, they were, how, our, how voices weren't considered in the, fra in the framing of our, the fabric of our, our nation. So as we think about how we bring about equity and how we talk about um, and understand what our biases are, there are a number of reasons why this should be important to us. One, it's the right thing to do. Two, our nation is becoming incredibly more diverse. They call it the browning of our country. I firmly believe that for systems and structures that are serving a, um, a wider and broader demographic in order for us to maintain our relevance and actually have outcomes that are beneficial for all of us, we need to understand these biases that they exist because we will, be, we will make ourselves irrelevant or, or not have the outcomes we're looking for if we don't acknowledge it. We, we should also understand that individual bias contributes to system bias. And if those system biases exist, then we have inequitable systems that can impact our outcomes. One of my colleagues, um, John Powell out of um, Berkeley, their Institute of Othering and Belonging, he talks about the new social contract. And essentially that new social, social contract says that we are inextricably linked. So my health is impacted to, by your health and your health is impacted by my health. We, this should be, we are, it's a truly a rising tide raises all boats type of thing. So our new social contract should include and value those alongside of us, even if they come from different walks of life and backgrounds. So one of the things that we're all striving for, and some of you may have seen this before, is equity. A lot of times when I have an opportunity to share and talk with folks, um, we focus on equality. Um, and while it sounds great, there is a distinction between equality and equity. And providing the same solution for everyone without an understanding of what their um, um, current reality is still leaves some people behind. So, what we need to do is to be able to take some time to understand what individuals' realities are. So when we bring forth a customized solution, it takes into, into account their personal situations and circumstances. One of the things that's not said here that I like to call out is it's, it can be a really reflexive reaction for us when we're in positions where we, under, where we believe we understand what the challenges are. We've done our reading, we've done our homework, we've engaged with, we've, We've engaged with other um, people who are in our space uh, academically or from a theoretical perspective. We might believe that we have a firm understanding of what the problems are and, and a firm understanding what the solutions might be. What's, in my opinion, implied here is that you need to spend some time with the people who are impacted to better un to understand what type of boxes they need versus having a paternal solution and saying, well, this is what you need. This is what I should offer you because you may, not, you may not be providing them with the right boxes that they need at the right times if you discount their voice in the conversation. So I just wanted to highlight that. And I've also had people to, when we talk about some of this equity work, that if we focus too much on one, in one group of individuals, then we are by default leaving other individuals out. And my response to that is that if you notice in this equity example here, everyone is finishing at the same space. We're not doing something, even though we may be addressing more to one individual situation because we now understand some of their concerns, we're all in a position where we can see now. And hopefully if we do this right, we end up in a place where there's a removal of barriers for all. So 
I'm sure many of you are familiar with the social determinants of health, but when we think about bringing about an equitable um, set of health, health outcomes for all, to me, it starts with the social determinants. And this has been a widely um, uh, known concept in the public health community that in addition to the care that you receive, you're also, your health is also impacted by the places in which you live, work, play, and worship. So your economic stability, your social and community context, the neighborhoods and zip codes in which you live, the healthcare access you have, education, all these things play a direct role on your health outcomes. One of the spaces that, that I think public health especially has sort of expanded to is understanding that those social determinants have an impact on, your, on the life course. So the things that you are experiencing, the health outcomes that you have are you experiencing now are directly impacted by generational impacts of the of the folks of your ancestors and those folks before you so if your ancestors and your your grandparents um, were in situations where they were um, experiencing stress or in environments where there was disinvestment uh, that can have and does have an impact on you now generations later so this life course theory and life course approach is sort of a in my opinion a building on to the social determinants, because you now understand that those social determinants impact you now, but have had an impact on you and from a generational perspective as well, and can impact the generations behind us. When I worked, I, I worked with the, Amer um, the Association of Maternal and Child Health Programs, working with maternal and child health directors at the state and territory level. One of the things they were all working on at the direction of um, former uh, uh, administrator Michael Liu, who headed up the uh, Maternal and Child Health Bureau, was this 12-point plan to address uh, and close that um, birth outcome or birth equity gap from black and white perspective. And there are a number of, in my opinion, very comprehensive approaches to this, this um, uh, to the, the narrowing of this gap. But one I think that um, bears some digging into, and we'll spend some time with that, is that from a state and territory perspective, people are talking about the need to undo racism and acknowledging the role that racism played on the life course theory and the, the, the um, role that the racism played on the social determinants. And we'll dig into that in a, in a second here. So just from a, from a framing perspective, racism is prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed against someone of a different race based on one's, on the belief that one's own race is superior. In my opinion, um, racism is implicit bias or bias in action. Um, and structural racism is when the basis, when, when biases are built into our systems, our infrastructure. This is a, 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 um, a quote that I, I, I want to read verbatim, and hopefully we can enter into a space of vulnerability here as we talk about some of these deeper issues. But a lot of times when, when I've been engaged in this conversation, as many of you may have been, um, people will say the system is broken. We have to fix a broken system. And while that sounds good and I'm not opposed to that, I think we need to understand from, from what this quote is saying here, that the system is not broken. It works as it was in, intended. Um, and if you think back to the visual I shared of the founding fathers, if there is no diversity in that room and the fabric of our, of our country, the fabric of our systems, our various systems are being built without the, the, the diverse opinions, diverse viewpoints, and diverse, perspective, diverse perspectives in that room, then that system is set up in a way to support those individuals who are in the room at the exclusion of the folks who are not at the table. So the system is broken from, our, from, from, a, from a consumer perspective, but it's functioning the way it was intended because there were no voices in the room at the time. No, no differing voices or dissenting voices, uh, diverse voices in the room at the time. And the result is it has, it's having a deleterious effect on communities of color because of those in, ingrained biases. So if we're going to really dig into the boxes in that equity and equality visual, I think it, it, it uh, requires us to do a little bit of digging to understand how we got here as a country. And, and this is a, a point that I wanted to, uh, in the presentation, I wanted to pause and just make sure we're gonna do a little bit of a, a walk down memory lane 
from a, a nation perspective, and some of the content is a little bit um, sensitive. So I just want to make sure you're okay with me digging in a little bit. Any any uh, opposition to that? Okay, seeing none. So I think what we need to understand um, is starting back with with slavery, is that there was a cost to slavery, um, and slavery was a business. Um, and from the, from the research I've I've uh, come across in twenty excuse me two thousand nine standards or two thousand nine dollars, the 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 um, uh, the translation of, of, of those dollars would be that this was somewhere between a six and a fourteen trillion dollar business. As a result of this business, there was an impact to the cultural identity of the families that were taken from their homelands, put into environments where their um, social their social fabric and their history was taken from them, language um, barriers they were not able to communicate with those around them loss of a, a proud cultural identity put in places where you may have been warriors in your communities uh, where you came from and caregivers to now being servants um, to other people. You had instances where families were intentionally ripped apart because they were so, they were seen as property. Um, mothers ripped from their child to their children, um, sold again as if they were property and then to I would say to make matters worse if you could, you're now being put in positions where you are providing care for someone else's family in a way that you may not be able to provide care for your own as a wet nurse or mammy or, or some of the other terms that were used in that, in, that, in that time. You have a situation here where um, there was a dehumanization of black women. Um, and I, I know many of you from previous presentations have seen the image on the left here from Dr. J, I'll, let me actually ask by show of hands, are you familiar with the image on the left? Okay, so you understand in this situation with Dr. J. Marion Sims, the founder, considered the founder of, of uh, gynecology, that he was in the process of getting ready to practice um, some of his procedures on enslaved women who there was no consent be able, to, able to be offered or um, anesthesia. So this was sort of the, again, because of the framing of, because of, of, of our uh, systems and culture at the time where women were seen, black women were seen as property, there's a devaluing and a dehumanizing of them, even from our earliest inception um, from a healthcare perspective. There was a study that was done um, and it compared general population perception to first, second, and third year, first, second, third year um, medical students and residents around some of the different perceptions of pain tolerance, um, black versus white. Um, blacks age more slowly than whites. Black nerve endings are less sensitive uh, than whites. Black people's blood coagulates more quickly than whites. Um, black or whites have larger brains than blacks. You can see some of the questions here um, that these uh, the, this population um, who participated in the study um, were, were asked and the percentages um, in the, the right hand column there. And one of the things that's a little bit concerning for me is that across some of these, there's not a huge distinction between the general population and the medical students. Um, but the other thing that, that to me is a little bit more concerning is that this was a study on uh, the University of Virginia, Virginia that was done in 2016. So these are still some, some existing biases um, in our medical uh, DNA that exists even today. And I know there's some work that's being done and there's conversations that are being done to teach some of the history and some of this in medical school courses now, but this is still, this, uh, this, this, uh, the current framing that is problematic is still, still alive and well and exists. It did not, all, the, the biases not only exist um, in, uh, in our healthcare system, Criminal, there's a criminal justice impact. Many of you may be familiar with the Black Codes, which was a way to, to reclaim um, your, the, the workforce that was lost um, by uh, having vagrancy laws. Um, you needed, uh, black people had to have written evidence of employment. Um, there was restrictions placed on land ownership. Um, so this was, these were efforts to, to reclaim the lost 13, 14 trillion dollar workforce um, during that time. Convict leasing was a thing. It still exists now and to some extent. 
uh, where you have um, uh, state-run prison, pri um, prisons who are contracting uh, their, their workforce out to corporate entities. This still exists, and this, uh, some of the things that were prevalent in the criminal justice system um, at the time were um, some of these um, lynchable offenses that included gambling, arguing with a white man, attempting to vote, flirting with white women, quarreling. Um, um, those are things that existed then and um, uh, were part of our criminal justice fabric as well. Many blacks wanting to, to flee some of that um, in the South moved uh, to the North um, to only run into it again in different forms. Um, through redlining, I think many of you are familiar with that, about the, um, the, um, how uh, there were communities that black folks lived in that were, were considered to be uninsurable. Um, black home ownership in areas would make, would make those spaces uninsurable. Um, black soldiers couldn't take advantage of the GI Bill benefits after World War II, even though they served nobly alongside their white soldier counterparts. And what was, ex uh, what was ex uh, um, a, a impact of that is that that was during a time when the generational wealth was being created because the, the property that you were able to buy into at that time being passed down from generations that you may have bought for $25,000 and is now a six, seven figure property now, that's generational wealth that was created and lost because individuals weren't able to get into those and uh, take advantage of that, that slice of the American dream. Um, that impact, um, because uh, it was made uninsurable from a, a housing standpoint, you also then saw um, a disinvestment from an educational standpoint, access to care. It then had a trickle-down impact in those communities. Uh, as a quick sidebar, I'll tell you that one of the, the roles that I had a privilege of, of, of having um, was I worked um, building, uh, um, doing community project work for um, Feed the Children, both domestically and internationally. And one of the things that we were trying to do domestically was to build a grocery store in the Lower Ninth Ward of New Orleans. Uh, because it was a food desert, we were trying to bring some healthy, fresh produce into the area. We also thought, thought it was an opportunity for job creation. Um, and um, some, uh, there were some edu educational components we were going to do to really make it a, 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 um, a full service shop in the Lower Ninth Ward. I will tell you that we tried to move mountains to bring funding into the Lower Ninth Ward to make that happen. And even though we were able to secure land, we, tried, we had some folks who were trying to bring funding in, some of the major corporate entities that we were reaching out to to try to invest in that space, we're still viewing it as being un un uninvestable because of the environments, the crime, and some of the things that was happening in those neighborhoods. So the, the lack of investment in those areas early on, again, has a, has a generational impact because even now, companies are making decisions from a dollars and cents perspective as to what brings them the best profit. And sometimes when they, when they do that analysis and there's been a consistent lack of investment, some of the other structural fabrics that the community needs, they will make a decision to go someplace else that's less risky, even though the, the, the ROI is similar in, 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 uh, com compared to other areas. I lived, I lived in Oklahoma for a period of time. Um, um, and you see, I, I've had a, a number of places I've lived, a rich life experience. So I'll, I'll, I'll refer back to that from time to time. Um, but even in Oklahoma, and not calling any one group out or any state out because this exists other, um, across the board, but there are racial disparities even um, as of 2018 of some of the mortgage approvals in Oklahoma City. So some of the, the bias and the structural racism that we talked about exists across um, our, our various systems, but it's still alive and well um, today. This impact from a mass incarceration perspective, higher education, earnings gap, and we talked about some of the disparities in hiring that created a wealth disparity. Um, I won't spend too much time here um, because I, I'm, uh, I'm getting somewhere with this, but um, I did want to talk a little bit about from a criminal justice perspective. When you look at the number of men um, who are um, uh, incarcerated, one in nine men, one in 17 white men, one in three black men, one in six Latino men, you look at some of these numbers and you might say, well, maybe crime is just happening in different spaces at a, at a larger rate. Um, and what, what the statistics and the research shows is that that's not the case. Crime happens every place. It's the way that it's being addressed, the penalties that come along with it. And I've actually had a good a friend of mine who talks about this on a national level, and he even argues that 
that crime is a social construct in the sense that uh, there's an activity that happens and how we approach it is what makes it either a criminal activity or a public health issue or whatever um, label we give to it. And though based on that, we have individuals who end up being incarcerated because of the way we've approached it, not necessarily what it actually is. And you could think about that from a, uh, the way our systems handled the cocaine and crack epidemic in the 90s versus how we handle um, opioid and substance use um, uh, uh, in the, the early 2000s and even now. You have an impact to families. This just talks a little bit about the interaction that, that children um, uh, in African-American homes come into contact with um, cr the criminal justice system. You can see in the yellow, it's at a much higher rate than their white counterparts. I am a big advocate of education, um, as I'm assuming many of you are. I, I believe I'm preaching to the converted. Um, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, they love me. <laughs> um, so I'm a huge advocate for education. Um, but education alone is not the cure to addressing some of the issues that we have here. Um, the example I offered earlier of Shalon Irving, she is a doctor, member of the Public Health Services Corps, and she still experiences some of the same inequities that, that we're detailing now. Um, and one of the things I think that's really important to notice here from a, a median net worth perspective, you've got a black um, a individual with a bachelor's degree and a white individual without a bachelor's degree and the median um, net worth is still uh, different. I'm not gonna spend too much time here because we've talked about this already. Um, you've seen this slide from earlier, but hopefully there's an understanding that the system is not broken, it's functioning in the way that it was intended. And because there weren't voices at the table, it's having a military impact on those folks who were not, did not have a seat. And I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that um, while I've been talking about this from a black perspective, our Native American brothers and sisters are experiencing and have experienced some of the same um, uh, challenges and are also experiencing some of the same inequities in their outcomes. How many of you are familiar with the, the weathering and toxic stress? So the reason why, um, that's good to hear, the, the reason why um, I wanted to kind of walk take a little bit of a walk down memory lane is because and, and reframe a little bit is because previously the focus was on race as being a risk factor and while race may indicate um, uh, from a statistical perspective prevalence and incidence of the occur occurrences of, of diseases uh, and chronic illnesses in, in, in different communities where the the because of what I just shared where the where the research has moved to is that racism is the risk factor not necessarily race because if you are an individual, if you kind of connect it back to life course and social determinants and those things I mentioned before, if you are an individual who has experienced consistent and chronic stress over the course of your life, um, what we know now is that you are more susceptible to chronic illnesses and having uh, negative health outcomes. So one of the things that Dr. Liu had shared with me one time when we were talking uh, about this was it's, uh, his, the analogy he shared was that it's almost like um, having a car that um, you run and run. And it's uh, for those of you who, who like to drive fast and you rev your car and, and car gets to higher RPMs. If you never downshift, you're going to burn out that engine, you're going to burn out that transmission. And what happens here from a weathering and chronic stress standpoint is that you're constantly, black women have constantly been racing and running at such a high RPM without downshift shifting from a stress perspective, that they're in positions to be a little more perceptible to the chronic health issues that we label and race as a risk factor when it really is the situations around them that have put them in positions to, um, to, to experience that. So the, the, the reframing is subtle, but I think it's an important one because when we start to think about solutions for this, we need to start to interrogate the systems versus what can happen sometimes, which is victim blaming or putting it on an individual for making a different, a different decision. So again, history matters to me because it's under, uh, important, especially as, as providers and people who are serving uh, communities, no matter if it's a public health perspective, healthcare settings, no matter what we're doing, it's important to understand the experience of those as best we can that we're serving and reframe the narrative because we understand that the individuals who've experienced this are 
um, capable, they're resilient, um, they are um, individuals who have um, overcome in spite of, the, the thinking and the approach to partner with them may be different than see them as a project that needs solving or support. Um, and that reframing, again, is subtle. But when I partner with someone, it's, it's, it's a much different, uh, there's, a, there's a value that I have now with that person versus when I see someone as a project who's giving a handout to, I'm giving a handout to. And when we know more about our history, then we can then target our solutions and hopefully not perpetuate the same disparities unintentionally because we're trying to do good, but recreating the same systems that we're a part of. And I think if we come to the table with this understanding as best we can, with some cultural humility and cultural congruence, we start to build trust with the communities and people that we're serving. So what can be done for me is to again, call out the problem because if we don't call it out, we're not addressing it directly. While I believe programs are great, um, I'm a, I'm a, I share with you that I, I've led community health programs, built community health programs. I think they're fantastic. I think what we also need to do in tandem is to also examine our systems that we've been talking about here. Um, by show of hands, I think this is almost a throwaway question. How many people have ever played Monopoly? Okay. Um, if you've ever played Monopoly, if you have a family of four um, and you invite three people into a game, you tell Johnny to sit on the side and do his homework or his chores and let everyone else start the game and they have played the game three or four times and gone around the board three or four times. And then you invite Johnny into the game. What happens? By the time he's, he comes into the game, most people have bought up all the property. For those aggressive players, you might have hotels and houses on property. And Johnny is now coming into the game, really just trying to get around the board, collect 200 bucks to pass go, um, maybe hit chance in community chest or something like that. Um, or a strategy might be to go to jail. My strategy, when, when my mom is an aggressive player, and when, when, my, when my mom plays, she owns a lot of property right off the back. And, and when I get in the game sometimes, the best strategy is to try to go to jail so I can just wait to try to jump, jump blocks to get around the board to get 200 bucks. That may be someone's strategy. But when you invite people into the game in that way, the deck is already set, and now they're in, a, in this position where they're relying on that 200 bucks to get around the board. And I think in some ways, we have structured our response to what I just shared with you in the same way. We're building our programs to provide the 200 bucks to folks to get around the board without interrogating the system to figure out how we expand that to actually open up spaces for them to buy property, buy houses, buy things so that they have a, a shot in the same way that others do. So in doing that, I think we have to be able to build a roadmap to make that happen, address our biases in those systems, working from our spaces of strength and influence as I mentioned earlier, the things that we're trying to deal with are not things that one group or one sector can solve on their own. They can have incremental gains, I think. But for us to really get to where we need to be, we have to partner strategically and think outside the box to do so, and then value others in that partnership way that I mentioned. Hammering that, hammering that um, uh, um, uh, monopoly visual home just a little bit more um, is, is this quote from Lyndon B. Johnson, that you do not take a person who for years has been hobbled by chains and liberate him, bring him up to the starting line of a race and then say, you're free to compete with all the others and still justly believe that you have been completely fair. So what has happened, um, sort of shifting a bit, now that we understand the history, now we understand the connections with social, social determinants and life course, you kind of set the stage here. What's happened over the last uh, several years is you have a lot more in organizations who on a national level are actually calling this issue out. And as I mentioned, I think it's important to do so to make sure we're really, we're really targeted with our solutions. So you've had the CDC, who's talked about um, racism as a public health threat, the American Medical Association, APHA, the American Public Health Association, and a number of other groups who are entering into the conversation to call this for what it is and then be able to build some solutions to support it. You've had the White House, um, who has recently um, 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 focused on this issue and has, has made a huge investment in the space. And I'll talk a little more about that in a second. Um, AWAN and other organizations, ACOG and a number of community-based organizations and others had a chance to participate with um, VP Harris uh, last year at their the first Maternal Health Day of Action, uh, where she called together stakeholders and identified areas of, of need and opportunity. 
Um, so uh, we, we hope there, there's hopeful for more things like that to come. Um, but there's some some meaningful change that she has tried to be, they've been trying to make as a result of the the um, the voices and the stakeholder meetings they've had from, had with folks to hear what the challenges are, to understand what those social determinants are, how they're impacting care and outcomes. Uh, build back better it passed the house. We still know it's it, it still it has not moved forward just yet, but there's a three billion dollar investment in there for maternal health. Part of what the White House is committing to is engaging in the healthcare industry and improving health outcomes. Um, looking to strength the McVie program, they've, they've uh, made an investment in the um, uh, state maternal health innovation program. When I was at AMCHIP, we worked very closely with a number of states um, who, are, who um, uh, were trying to partner with community-based organizations and, and others to figure out how to deliver care and, and, and support their um, uh, patient population in a different way. And then I think um, even for those industries who were reluctant to um, um, uh, invest in telehealth, uh, I think that was another unintended consequence or potential unintended benefit of COVID that with us being uh, forced to be in a virtual platform, some of the, the, the emphasis on virtual offerings and telehealth, I think, was expanded. And when I was in my former role, uh, we were working with a number of states to release some policies and provide some support to give capacity, build capacity to states to support their programmatic offerings, their partners in, in delivering telehealth in a, in, a, in a meaningful way. Some other things that are happening at a legislative level, um, there's the Black Maternal Health Caucus. Um, and what they have done is they have um, worked with, it's, it's, it's being led by Representative Underwood, Representatives Underwood and, and Adams. Um, they've worked with approximately 250 organizations um, and they have uh, been working with this group with these groups to pass the black maternal health momnibus have, have any of you heard the momnibus before is this new so the black maternal health momnibus um, i'll dig into a little bit deep uh, more deeply it had 170 plus co-sponsors and what this bill was trying to do was to dig into the areas that we just talked about um, across the board um, from a social determinants of health perspective to really look at this holistically to address social determinants, to address implicit bias training, uh, to uh, address some of the community-based partnerships. So they try to take a really holistic approach to this in a series of about 12 um, bills here. Um, I can send this over, Dr. Gosa, if you're okay a little bit later so people can see this, but these are some of the things that the act covers. Um, so as I mentioned, it makes critical investments in social determinants. Um, it provides funding to community-based organizations who are on the ground serving populations. So while doctors, physicians, nurses are meeting the clinical care needs, um, you have community-based organizations that can help with some of those um, issues and identify community assets to get people the supports they need so that when they get, when they receive care or, 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 or prescriptions or, or direction for how they can uh, bring about and support their care, you have individuals in the community who can support folks to do things like find um, fresh fruits and vegetables or find supports that will help them even though they may be living in a maternity desert or a, um, a food desert. Um, looking at how to support um, uh, pregnant and postpartum veterans, um, growing and diversifying the perinatal workforce, one of the issues that we see across the board that would help in the cultural congruence and cultural uh, humility is making sure that the workforce, perinatal workforce, looks like the people they serve. And if you don't address some of the educational social determinant barriers we talked about before and go upstream in doing that, it's very difficult to make sure that happens. I, I have the privilege of serving on the American Board of Pediatrics Foundation, and I know from talking to them, from talking to my A1 membership, this is a real issue for folks to try to figure out how to diversify our pipeline of providers, at a, not just at the medical and nursing school stage, but how do we go further upstream to get folks involved in high school and interested in those kind of things so they can then um, get into some of those um, post-secondary opportunities. Data collection, supporting moms from a maternal mental health perspective, goes as far here to work with incarcerated moms, provides uh, uh, investments in telehealth, looking at innovative payment models. So these are some of the things that are included in the 12 different um, uh, bills within the Black Maternal Momnibus. Along with those bills, there's investments. So it's not just here's what we should do. There's money that comes along with it. So I won't go through all of these, but you can see there's significant amounts, 175 million, 275 million for the workforce. There's a lot of resources that the 
uh, Build Back Better and Maternal uh, and the uh, Black Maternal the Black um, uh, Momnibus, the Total Health Momnibus um, covers to put their money where their mouth is to address some of the underlying structural issues that we just talked about. One of the ones I wanted to call out in there, um, so Charles Johnson, as I mentioned, is a good friend of mine, and one of the things I admire most about him is that he has opened himself up to be really vulnerable to share his family story, but he didn't just leave it there. So he's also been an advocate for several years to try to make sure that no other family experiences the same thing that he uh, and his family had to experience. So there's a, a, a bill that he's been working on with the Black Maternal Health Caucus as well. Um, and these are some of the things that this bill will do in terms of providing for community-based programs, training healthcare providers on, on bias and discrimination, respect for maternity care compliance. And one of the things that, that he's talked about is there's a patient satisfaction, a patient accountability office that will be connected to somebody's healthcare system so that it's not directly a, uh, affiliated with, but is in the same space as the healthcare system. So individuals have an opportunity to go and share what their experiences are from a satisfaction and accountability standpoint. CMS, if you have, a, have been following some of this, um, CMS is looking to do some things as well that's supported through the um, Build Back Better um, uh, initiative. The Birthing Friendly Hospital designation, um, they have that coming out. If, if anyone has, um, is, is interested in that, I can provide the resource, the link to you, but they're in the, the public comment period now. So if you have an opportunity and a, and a desire to, to read through what's happening with the birthing friendly hospital designation and, and lend your voice, you can do that now. Um, and then they've also been looking for ways to make an easier state pathway to extend Medicaid and the CHIP program coverage for 12 months uh, postpartum. And there are a number of states now who have already started this process, 11 states in DC who are in some um, uh, version of this as of April 13th. I'm sure you've all seen or familiar with some of the practice opportunities to bring about equitable care. Um, the AIM patient safety bundles, uh, per, uh, perinatal quality collaborators, opportunities for individuals and health systems to take a backwards look if they have the unfortunate occurrence of a maternal death, can look backwards and understand what went wrong and what needs to be done or improved. Um, I will share with you briefly um, A1's version of the Respect Maternity Care Guidelines, but there are a number of organizations like A1, like the National Birth Equity Collaborative, like um, ACOG, I believe, um, that are looking to build Respect Maternity Care Guidelines so that when their providers um, understand the bias, understand some of the challenges that we've just walked through and say, you know, now that I know better, I'm interested in doing better, help me out. There's some guidelines and toolkits that are, are there for their, their support. And then A1 is in the, uh, is uh, later this month, we'll be releasing some staffing standards because one of the challenges that we've seen is that with, there was always a nursing shortage and provider shortage. Now we've seen that even uh, exacerbated um, in the wake of COVID. And it's hard to talk about even just the provision of equitable care if we haven't even gotten to a quality level, a certain quality measure from a staffing perspective. So we're making recommendations around this and working with CMS and others to see if they can, and, um, and um, payers, to see if they can support these, these, um, these models. A number of professional organizations like ours are also talking about how to diversify our membership base because when we're releasing guidelines and we're releasing um, policy standards or products for public consumption, we need to acknowledge some of the history we just talked about, which is that if, if we don't have a diverse um, sampling of folks in the room, there's a, a potential for us to be well-meaning but missed the mark because we haven't included all the folks, all the stakeholders in the conversation. And that um, is not just from a racial and ethnic perspective, it's from a clinical specialty perspective, it's from a geographic perspective because the needs and resources may be different in an urban setting and a rural setting. So figuring out to make sure we have all of the right voices in the table as best we can to make sure whatever product we release is actually one that is beneficial for our largest group of members and, and, and the folks they're supporting. As I mentioned, we've, we've uh, released the respect, respectful um, nursing care guidelines, and this is what it looks like to us, that we treat every patient equally and equitably. Uh, we're using cultural and linguistic competency. We're understanding the patient's perspective, communicating with respect, and we're trying to find and build collaborative environments that partner with other provider colleagues, but also put people in a position where they feel comfortable holding each other accountable and having conversation when they see something that runs afoul to um, what they believe is equitable care. This is a snapshot of our, our framework. I'm happy to share this 
a little bit later if anyone is interested in it. A number of organizations like A1 is, is also releasing position statements on racism and bias in maternal care settings. Um, and again, I think this is important because for organizations to call it out is important for people then to be able to do something about it. We've talked about the national things that are being done, the professional things that are being done, the policy things that are being done to address this. But I think, as I mentioned before in an earlier slide, because our systems are based on and supported by people, one of the things that we need to be able to do is to address our own bias. Um, and one of the, 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 some of the things we can do to support that is educating ourselves, hopefully being comfortable enough to engage in honest conversations with others that are outside of our typical realm of, of contact, being a little bit self-aware to understand how our conversations might be impacting folks. Um, one of the things that, that, that my wife and I have talked about, um, she's an attorney, um, is that she works with um, a lot of very brilliant folks who have no issues um, saying very difficult things in Latin, right? But she is a Mexican, um, African-American, and her name is Lara. It's got a rolled R, but everybody always calls her Lara. And she's, there's, from a, from a self-awareness perspective, understanding that there is some bias and, and micro-invalidations in there when you can pronounce significant me medical terms or, 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 or legal terms, but then when a patient wants to be called something or pronounce, it's difficult to pronounce their name. So being self-aware of those type of biases and how they might show up, it seems like a small thing, but it goes a long way to be valuing the patient population you're serving. And to be able to do that, obviously you need to meaningfully engage with different groups and then accept the challenge here to be anti. And in this context, it's anti-racist. And racist can be a, a charged term, but just to define that for folks, if you have not had a chance to read Ibram Kendi's book on um, how to be an anti-racist, his definition is one that I really enjoy. And if you understand what we just talked about, about how our systems have been created um, in many ways um, with explicit bias because of the, the, um, the people who were in the room and the value that were value of the people who were not in the room that were um, that's been placed on them. And understanding this, that the structural race of uh, an understanding of the structural racism that exists in our systems, then we should all be striving to be anti-racist in whatever that means. So that is not just saying I'm not racist because I don't hold these views but actively looking for ways to address the policies, address the inequity, inequities, address the systemic um, bias that we see in a really meaningful and targeted way. So embracing that challenge to be anti-racist. I firmly believe that if we're gonna do this work together, if we're gonna do this work, it should be done together because as I mentioned several times throughout this presentation, while we do have our slices of the pie, I do think it's, it's, it's a big enough issue that will require some innovation and some partnership across the various spectrums and, and focusing on how we can set milestones, be actionable, not just have lip service around it, but set some targets to hold us accountable uh, to this work. Teamwork truly does make the dream work. And one of the things that I will um, leave you with before um, I, I close is that when I, had, when I was um, doing this work early on in um, international settings, one of the things that was uh, the learnings that I got from my experience was this really uh, this unique focus on number two, two and three, bullets number two and three here, which is having a community asset mindset and avoiding the opportunity to be paternal. So what that means for me is that as you are partnering, whether it's in a clinical setting or in a um, community setting, you understand the strengths and the value of the people you're engaging with because they have the solutions, they have some of the 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 um, the knowledge of their specific situation. And because of that, we need to see them as an asset and not something we have to work around. And that takes us to a place where we hopefully can be avoid being paternal, where we're just providing what we think is the right thing without engaging in that meaningful dialogue to understand where they're coming from. So I do believe that together we can improve health outcomes for women and children who are championing for uh, equity for, and I should also include in this slide women, children, and birthing people, because as we're looking to be more inclusive of pregnant people, um, we understand that people are presenting to us in different ways now. And I, I, I'm excited to always engage with diverse groups of individuals because um, I, this is a mantra and, a, and a, a, a proverb that I 
and joy and love to live by. If you want to go someplace fast, go alone. If you want to go someplace far, go together. So we're really trying to make significant impact in this space, being able to extend our arms and engage with those folks in our settings and our sectors and those folks outside of our sectors is really important. I'm thankful that, that I can be, I'm considered, even though you may look at me and say as a man who's talking about maternal health, um, I have been thankfully invited in as an ally. Um, um, and one of the, the beauties of that for me is that um, it's a realization that it takes all of us collectively to move this work forward and not just place it on one segment of our population, to do it on their own. Because of the importance of this issue, if we want to get down the road together, we need to work collaboratively and collectively to move this forward. Thank you so much for your time, uh, and I'll take any questions that we have time for, Dr. Gleason. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, we are out of time, but if we have a um, burning question that anybody has, we can answer. I didn't see any questions in the chat, but if anybody has, you can unmute yourself and speak. Dr. Wynn. I have not read the book myself, but um, in thinking about this topic, my husband's reading the book 1619 right now, and also thinking to black maternal health in the country during slavery that the more slaves you have, the more power you have. And so just the frequency with which the white slave owners might rape the slaves to produce more workers because those slaves automatically became African-American is really interesting too to think about in the context now of our Roe v. Wade talk and looking at the states that are very much against um, you know, women being able to, to think about what they can do with their bodies. Um, I never really thought about that from a, a maternal health standpoint of black women um, during the time of slavery and thinking of them historically from a white man perspective of um, using their body as a vessel for a financial means. Yeah, I think it's an interesting point. I mean, if you if you kind of look, if you kind of look at going back to the things that have become woven into our our national DNA. Um, I think at, this, at the heart of your question is if you were considered at the time when some of these things are being framed to be property, to be some, to not have autonomy over your own body, um, how might that thinking continue to be woven into our approaches now from a legislative perspective? Um, and what do we need to do to, to, to dismantle that thinking that um, provides the ownership and the, and the autonomy to the people who have the best um, uh, uh, the, the, most, the most stake in it and the best say over what, me, what it means to them. So I think challenging and understanding that our systems are based on that like control and lack of for some people is a starting point to then be able to, to share power and, and, and adjust the dynamic there to, re, to release that control back to people who are in the best position to make decisions for their own situations. Thank you for that awesome talk. One thing I've been wrestling with both in the avenue of research as well as um, patient care is how to get the voice of the, the, the consumer. And I wonder, A, if having a patient um, representative group is helpful to get the voice of consumer and how to do that effectively so it doesn't become the session where people just unleash their, I guess, complaints, but more like a productive session to hear the voice to then make policy. So I would be um, interested in your insight on kind of using that avenue. Yeah, so, so the, the question is how to get more patient voice into the conversation in a meaningful way when it's not just um, uh, uh, combative. So I think from an advocacy perspective, we're seeing a lot of that now. I mean, Charles's situation is a little bit different because he's got, you know, this this case with the with the with the uh, Cedar Sinai. 
but there have been a number of folks, um, community-based organizations, doula representing organizations who are bringing the voices of their patient population to the com to the stakeholder meetings that Vice President Harris and other folks are, are, are having in a way that doesn't feel to me to be combative. Um, I do think that um, some of the conversations are difficult to hear in general. Um, um, talking to my members, talking to other providers, it's a very difficult and, and challenging conversation to have when everyone gets into the space to provide quality care. And if, you're, and if, you, um, if something happens that, that doesn't support that, um, it's a difficult conversation initially to have with someone if you're feeling that you're doing a, a, this thing, but it results in, in, in something negative. So I think um, the more that we can sort of normalize the conversation uh, through some of the advocacy of the CDC and others, the more we start to hear and repeat the, the message around people like the Charles Johnsons, the Serena Williams, the, the um, Shalon Irvings of the world, I think the conversation will hopefully not be so normalized that it's dismissed as like, oh, just a thing, but people will hopefully get a little bit, um, um, uh, there'll be a little bit less um, um, combativeness when we talk about that. I also think the, the office that the Kira Johnson Act could potentially create to have some sort of uh, patient accountability arm that um, can digest and share the information in, with, the health, with health systems in a way that, that still has the patient voice involved but may not be a direct um, feedback um, uh, between patient and their provider. I think that might provide a little bit of a buffer to then take those the learnings there, quantify them, and hopefully make them into some level of uh, policy. But I think it's a difficult thing to do because it's a very sensitive topic for folks on all sides of the spectrum. Thank you so much, Mr. Webb, for that presentation and also more of a comment, but just again, thank you. Um, I think here at USU, we're looking for how do we weave this in, right, into the curriculum? Because to your point, I mean, medical students, residents are still graduating, having these misconceived ideas about racial differences with regard to skin thickness, for example, right? This is a problem. Um, and I, I do think we're making some incremental change. And I, I just saw a slide recently um, that we're gonna be having a discussion, a session, I think 90 minutes on sort of systems, historical um, discussion of racism from a historical and systems perspective for the first time happening this fall. Um, and then following that up with sort of a reflective um, sort of introspective activity for the students. So um, I just really appreciate this material and trying to think how do we weave this in because we don't, you know, the goal is not to just induce a shame reaction, right, in our medical students, but to inform them of the system that they're inheriting right, as brand new med students, and we have to do that properly. It's just um, a challenge. It is, I, I appreciate the comment, and and um, one of the things that's that's not easy to, I, I'm glad to, I'm, I am, from the conversations I've been having, I'm glad to see and hear that some of this, the, the, the things they've been talking about here have, uh, there's curriculum being built for, there's conversations with medical schools and others to try to weave it in to address some of the bias we're talking about. But I, I, I also think, that in having these conversations to, to address the concern, and it's not easy to do, but when we can have more of a mindset to call people in versus calling them out, uh, I think we're in a better place because as I mentioned earlier to your question, Dr. Harris, um, I don't think anyone gets into the space of service to cause harm, right? Um, so when we're in a, in a place where we need to have an honest conversation about something, can we do that in a way that, uh, that inspires or encourages folks to get the education, to go beyond their circles, to challenge and interrogate the systems that they're in in a different way, but do that in a way that doesn't have a scorched earth kind of now because you've made a misstep or because you've asked a question, because you've identified a problem that you are either now pushed to the side or, or, or now labeled as a person who doesn't get it. Uh, because my my thought on that, especially in in this space, is that if we if we approach it in a way that we're calling folks out in a negative way, um, too negative a way, people will, did, will will step back. They won't want to engage. They won't want to have the conversation, and they'll still be in positions to do, be doing the same things they're doing. So I think you can get to the same place by calling people in. 
by having honest conversations, encouraging folks to get to training, holding people accountable. We're not, we're not releasing them from that responsibility, but doing it in a way that invites them on a journey, understanding that people don't start here. It may take a couple steps to get there. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Webb, for that great presentation and for following discussion. And thank you everyone for participating in person as well as virtually. Um, I will get whatever materials that you share with me and share it back um, with everyone. Um, so thank you and this ends our grand rounds.